Hey, good afternoon, family. Got excuse to the shaking. This this uh, holder that I have is not very not very stiff. But uh, I want to talk about salvation. All right, because I've been asked quite often, quite a, a lot. When we talk about history. Biblical history or just history. I get asked a lot. So what does this have to do with my salvation? And this is the question that's posed by a lot of black Christians. So we're going to dig into this. So let me start off by making it plain. Let me just lay Good foundation. <clears throat> so we're talking about salvation, what we call salvation. Before you get done watching this video, you will understand that salvation is not heaven. Salvation in the Bible, not what we've called it talking about the words that's translated salvation in the Hebrew and Greek did not mean heaven. Salvation and eternal life are synonymous in the Bible. Salvation and eternal life were synonymous in the Bible and neither one of them was referring to heaven or anything in the afterlife. So let's get into this. All right, so let's start off with salvation. So the word that's translated salvation in the Bible is the Hebrew word, so uh, excuse me, the Hebrew word Yeshua, which is Jesus' name. It really was Joshua, but we would call it Joshua, but there was no J in the Hebrew Greek language. We know that there's no J in the original language. <clears throat> so it was, uh, but it was what we would call Yeshua and Joshua are the same names. So that was salvation in the Hebrew. In the Greek, salvation is the is the Greek word soteria. All right. So those two words come from some root words. So in the, in the Hebrew, the root word or the word that Yeshua comes from, and Yeshua, let me just straighten this, let me, let me just say this first. So Yeshua is a shortened firm, is a shortened form of the word uh, Yahashua, which was the actual Hebrew name for Jesus, Yahashua. I'm saying Yahshua. Now, salvation comes from a word, or, or we'll say Yahshua comes from a word that means, that is translated to be saved. Saved, right? So when we, we say when we receive salvation, we are saved. The Bible says, uh, you know, a lot, there, there, a, lot, a lot of mentions, a lot of scriptures in the Bible reference being saved. All right? Uh, you shall be saved. So, a lot of people tend to say, well, what are we saved from? Well, that's not proper because you're, you, you are referencing an English definition. So the word saved in the English dictionary, if you define the word saved, it means Webster's Dictionary. It means to be rescued from, right? To be saved from something. So that's a legitimate question if that word was translated correctly. Right? But it wasn't not as far as 
from what the dictionary meaning of the word saved is, it is not, it does not line up with the uh, Hebrew origin of the word saved. So the word saved, so Yahshua comes from the Hebrew word Yasha, right? And the Greek word soteria, which is translated salvation in the Greek, the New Testament was translated from the Greek. Old Testament from the Hebrew. So, uh, soteria comes from the word sozo. And that word sozo, if you look that up in Strong's Concordance, I use Blue Letter Bible, blueletterbible.org. Um, that, that's what I like to so if you go to Blue Letter, Blue Letter Bible, I think it's dot, dot .com or .org, anyway, it's a strong concordance. You'll see that when you look up uh, the word saved in the Greek, it translates to a word sozo. And that word sozo means to be completely delivered, to be whole, to be whole, complete, right? Nothing is left out when you're biblically saved. Right? And I say again, that word saved is not even a correct uh, translation, but since that's the word that we use, then we'll use that word just for this uh, for this video. So biblical salvation means to be completely whole, completely delivered, completely free, complete. In the Bible, the, the mindset was about being complete, whole. Nothing is missing. This is foundational. Nothing is supposed to be missing in our lives the way God set it up. This is why Jesus had to die because you know, we, was, we weren't complete in our conscience. You know, so anyway, that's getting on to something else. So now when we're talking about our biblical history, so for those who haven't been following me or this channel, my Facebook page or been on my website www.twbkstruth.com twbkstruth.com it's the world's best kept secret website um, for those who haven't been following or might not know that the descendants of the biblical Israelites migrated to West Africa after they were put out of Israel in 70 AD. After they were put out, they, uh, they migrated from Egypt and some of them couldn't go to Egypt because the Romans had taken over Egypt too. So they was they were actually coming, to, so they couldn't go to Egypt, but they went down through Ethiopia and, and they migrated over. Anyway, they ended up on the west coast of Africa. They were all throughout Africa, but a lot of them, millions of them, ended up on the west coast of Africa, and that's where the transatlantic slave trade took place, right? So the people who were brought over here as slaves from West Africa, many of them, not all of them, but many of them were descendants of the biblical Hebrews. And this is a fact. I went over to Africa a couple months ago, and like I said, it's not a secret over there. I, my actual driver who was driving me around was from the God tribe, GA, the God tribe. And he was telling me their history. They came from Africa. I mean, they came from uh, Israel. So I told him, I asked him what tribe he was. He said, God. 
I said, oh, y'all came from Israel, right? And he kind of chuckled. He said, oh, you know our history. And he, he said, yeah, you know, we migrated from Israel. So, so, and I did a DNA test. I did a few DNA tests and confirmed that. Now, on these DNA tests, I'm gonna get back to the subject. There's just been a lot of twisting and tangle up of the context of history. But on those DNA tests, so when I say that I've had a DNA test to confirm this, when you take a DNA test, it's not going to come back and say that you have Hebrew or Jewish ancestry, right? There wasn't no Jews. Jew was a created word. They were really Judeans or Judaites. Anyway, the, the DNA test itself is not going to say that. The way you find out if you are so-called African-American, really, I call us all African Hebrews, I'll tell you in a minute. But it, <clears throat> if you're gonna find out whether you were Hebrew, whether you had Hebrew ancestry through a, Hebrew ancestry through a DNA test, then what you would do was you take your DNA test and you find out what tribe from West Africa that you descended from. And if that tribe is, is, is descendants or descendants of the biblical Hebrews, then you are a descendant of a biblical Hebrew and therefore you have Hebrew ancestry. Right? So I, I can, I'm not gonna stay on that too long. Now, understanding all of that, understanding that information is a big part in making you whole because not only are we supposed to be whole in our health, right? In our families, like, you know, we should, we should be whole in our health, our families, financial situations. Uh, we should be whole in our history and culture. So we're not, we're not supposed to be angry, you know? We're not supposed to be left just upset. We're not left, we're not supposed to be left not knowing who we are, right? Excuse me, that's not whole, that's not complete. So, our history and knowing our history and culture is in the package of salvation. We are supposed to be whole. We're supposed to be complete. And because this form of slavery that we endured in this Western culture, this form of slavery, which was not biblical slavery, right? Biblical slavery was not this type of slavery that our ancestors went through. We have to make that clear also. Because they want you to think, they meaning Europeans, they want you to think that their ancestors' form of slavery was the typical ancient slavery. But I'll tell you like this, it wasn't. Right? This was a new slavery that had never seen, had never been seen before in history. And the reason why I say that is because so the so the biblical Hebrews were enslaved in Egypt. We know this in Genesis, the book of Genesis. They were enslaved in Egypt. And when they were delivered out of Egypt, when they were delivered out of Egypt, they did not, after they were delivered, they did not think they were Egyptians. Matter of fact, they weren't confused about who they were before they went in to slavery. We don't know who we were before slavery. That part has been stripped. That has never been seen before in history. To where when the people went in slavery and when they came out, they didn't know who they were when they went in. And there were so many other dy uh, dynamics of this slavery that hadn't, that was not biblical slavery, wasn't African slavery, it wasn't African slavery. There was a man named Ola Uda Equiano. Ola Uda Equiano, if you research him, he was enslaved. Uh, he was captured from what is now Nigeria. He was an Igbo, I-G-B-O or I-B-O, Igbo. He wrote a book in the 1700s. He was enslaved over in uh, Europe. England, I think. So he wrote a book, Ola Uda Equiano. Look him up. He wrote a book, and it's, it's free. It's on 
the internet. It's called The Interesting Narratives of Ola Uda Equiano. And he wrote in his book, in the beginning of his book, you'll read, you'll, you'll see, it, he talks about when he was captured, him and his sister were captured, I think he was like 11 years old. And he talks about his experiences after he was captured by Africans. We'll talk about that too. But he was captured by Africans, sold to an African family and sold from, from family to family on his way to the coast. Well, he explains that the way he was treated by the Africans was almost like he was part of the family, all right? It wasn't until he got into European hands that he experienced some of the most abominable things that he had ever witnessed in life. I mean, there was no comparison to the way he was treated when he was in Africa. That was biblical slavery. Biblical slavery was, was African. The Hebrews were African. I ain't got time to get into all that. I'm writing a book, and uh, all that will be in the book. Uh, or, or you can go to my website, like I said, uh, W, let me see, T-W-B-K-S-T-R-U-T-H, the world's best, which acronym, T-W-B-K-S is an acronym for the world's best kept secret. T-W-B-K-S-Truth.com, and you'll get this information. But So, <clears throat> so I was making a point that biblical slavery was not this Western slavery. That's what they want you to think it is, but it wasn't, all right? So slavery stripped us, this slavery stripped us of our history. And, and people, even black people will use that against you when you start talking about your history and they don't see how it relates to, to, to the Bible because our situation is unique. It has never happened before in history. We don't have any uh, templates. We don't have anybody else to pattern ourselves after. Right? We just have to do what we know we have to do. And this is in the package of being whole. Right? So, so being whole is what salvation in the Bible was. And it was actually called eternal life. So I made the point earlier, I was saying eternal life and salvation is not about heaven. So I asked a question, when does your eternal life begin, All right? When does your eternal life begin? Does it begin after you die? Does it begin on judgment day, All right? When does your eternal life begin? Because we always talk about eternal life in the context of after we die you know my eternal life so we look at that as some spiritual thing and it's it is spiritual but it's so what does the bible say because i don't want to give you my opinion too many people are out here giving their opinions and and messing people up and confusing them. the bible says in first john 5 11 and 12 it says, this is not verbatim, but you read it. It says, we have this eternal life. He says, John says, but we have this eternal life. And the life is in his son. And his is God. I'm talking about God's son. So, whosoever hath life, who, whosoever hath his son, hath life. And whosoever had not his son had not life. 1 John 5, 11 and 12. So that actually says that when you have God's son, then you have eternal life. So your eternal life begins when you accept Jesus into your heart. Right? That's when your eternal life begins. So it don't begin after you die. Your eternal life don't begin after you die. Your eternal life begins right now after you accept Jesus Christ into your heart. That's what the book says. So there's nothing in the Bible that says that your eternal life doesn't begin until after you die. 
So, so salvation is for right now, right? Your eternal life begins right now. So we should be whole right now. And the Bible actually also says to work out your soul salvation. So there's something, God's not gonna do everything. There's something that we have to do. <clears throat> God wouldn't be just if he did what we can do. I wouldn't do that for my child. Nobody, no really loving parent would do for your child what they could and should do for themselves. It's good, that's a blessing in that. So, salvation is about being whole or complete. It's about being whole. Nothing is supposed to be missing in biblical salvation. This is where our history comes in. This is why even in the Bible, the biblical Hebrews, they didn't separate their history from their worship like we've been trained to do. This culture, this culture does not, uh, they try to separate history from the spiritual because their history is not very spiritual. All right. So they don't like to talk about history. They don't like to talk about history. But our history is a need for us. It's a need for black people because they were stripped. All right? Our history was stripped. And salvation is about being whole. So us digging up our history and getting it, getting it in the proper context. Because some, we, we, we may even know bits and pieces, but the chronologically or the right order or the context of it gives a totally different picture than a lot of the images that we've been taught, even about Africa. Right? Just, there are just a lot of misnomers uh, that's just not true, just not true. So everybody should have a healthy image of themselves. You don't have to be lied to to make it you know, make yourself appear to be more than what you are. Just find out who you are. Because that's God's desire. Even, even in the law, the Hebrews law, the his, their history was in the law, the covenant. Moses wrote it down and it went all the way back to Adam. That was their history. It was important for them to know their history. History is spiritual. History is not carnal. History is not carnal. That was one of the first videos that I made. Put out there, I was explaining that history is not carnal. History is spiritual. It's this culture that has a problem with it because their history is not a good history. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not vilifying them. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just telling you their history as a whole. They have a lot of dark places in there, especially in this culture. So they discourage talking about history, especially in a spiritual conversation or a spiritual context or in a spiritual setting. But because we need it, it is spiritual for us. You got to realize uh, we have a unique conversation. We have a unique situation, so we need a we need a unique conversation. And um, even God, God had you un had unique conversations. God didn't lump everybody together like this culture does. So even in the Bible, there's a book called the Book of Hebrews. There's a book called the Book of Hebrews. And the Book of Hebrews in my Bible, I don't have it with me, but in my Bible, the Book of Hebrews on the first page where it says, I'm kind of jumpy here. The roads, are, the roads are bad. The roads are bad. But in my Bible, uh, 
Hebrews 1 and 1 on that first page it says above where it says above Hebrews 1 and 1 where it gives a title of the book my Bible says the apostle uh, uh, the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews look in your Bible Hebrews 1 and 1 and on that page the book of Hebrews but the book the, my point is that book was written to the Hebrew people it wasn't written to the Gentiles The book of Hebrews was written to Hebrew people. It was written to a specific people, right? Not because salvation is different for the Hebrews per se, but the conversation is different because there are different needs. The Hebrew people had a priesthood, what's called a priesthood. You'll never see the word priest, let alone priesthood, and no letters to the Gentiles. None of them. None of them. You won't find it. So God was explaining through Paul this new priesthood in Jesus Christ to a people who had a priesthood. So God was explaining this priesthood of Jesus Christ, which is eternal, to a priesthood, to a people who had a priesthood, which was a temporary, temporary priesthood. That's why he brought up Melchizedek. In the book of Hebrews, and he's talking about the priesthood. The whole pre, the whole uh, book of Hebrews was about priesthood, basically. To be brought up Melchizedek, which was a real person. It wasn't no symbolic something. It was a real person who lived and who Abraham paid tithes to. And when people will argue this because of one scripture in Hebrews seven and three, where it says that where it talks about not having uh, father, mother, <clears throat> neither beginning of days nor end of life, but was made like unto the Son of God. <clears throat> a priest, uh, a priest continually. Well, that verse right there explains what he's talking about. It's talking about the office of a priest. It's not talking about Melchizedek the person. It's saying a pre the priesthood has no beginning. No end of days. No father, no mother. The priesthood, because it's an eternal priesthood. It's not an earthly priesthood. The priesthood of Jesus Christ. Psalms 1, I can't remember where it is in the book of Psalms, where some might, so Psalm 119, 4, 114, 4. It says, talks about Jesus. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So it's talking about a, thou art a priest forever. The book of Hebrews was talking of the, 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 that verse, Hebrews 7 and 3, was talking about the priesthood. It wasn't talking about Melchizedek, the person. And the reason why I was saying that is because the priesthood of Melchizedek, so Melchizedek was a king and a priest. And in Hebrew culture, in Hebrew culture, nobody was ever king and priest, the same person. Nobody. King David was a king, he wasn't a priest. Right? Hezekiah, none of them. It was all kings. They weren't priests. But so, so Melchizedek was a king and a priest. So, so the Bible was saying that Jesus Christ was going to be a priest forever after the order, or in the same manner. That word after the order means really in the same type, the same way that Melchizedek was, meaning he was a king and a priest. But Melchizedek was a Canaanite, which was an African. No, that killed a bunch of people right there. <laughs> but he was king of Salem. Salem was Salem was was called Jerusalem. Now it was called Salem. Now it's called Jerusalem. And Salem or Jerusalem was originally or still is in the land that's called Canaan. They changed it to Israel, or Palestine. But it was originally called the land of Canaan. Canaan was Ham's son. Ham was an African. He's the only son of Noah that all scholars and historians and preachers and teachers agree on the ethnicity of. They have a conversation about Shem and Japheth. And I know I'm getting out there, but all of these things need to be explained. So there is no, my point is there is agreement among the scholars, everybody, that Ham was an African. Ham is the only son of Noah with proof of his ethnicity. 
right? He had a son named Cush. Greeks called Ethiopians. He had a son named Mitzrayam, who the Greeks called Egypt, but they didn't call themselves Egypt. They called themselves Kim. Kim. They called themselves Kim. Kim means black. <clears throat> they called their land Kemet. The Greeks called them e uh, called their land Egypt and called them e Egyptians. And the ancient Greek historian Herodotus saw the he wrote in his work called Histories that he saw the ancient Egyptians face to face. He called them, he said that he described them as being dark skinned with woolly hair, right? Africans. So I'm just saying the Can ancient Canaanites were Africans. Some people, some people tried to even say that, that they were white people because of the curse that Noah, not God, Noah put on Canaan. It wasn't put on Ham, it was put on Canaan. It was Ham's son, but Ham was an African. So his sons were African. The Bible says nowhere that Noah had children of different races. So <clears throat> this whole myth that Ham was black, Shem was Middle Eastern, Japheth was white, well, that's not in scripture. That was conjured up to justify slavery and the slave trade. I always say that if you know the ethnicity of one person in any family, you know the ethnicity of the family. It's not complicated. It was an African family. Noah's family was an African family. So Abraham, okay, so this um, lineages are not ethnicities by definition. So you can't say that somebody is a Shemite, but when you say somebody is a Shemite, that's not an ethnicity, that's a lineage. And if you haven't defined the ethnicity of Shem, then that still doesn't give you an ethnicity, okay? So if you understand that Shem was an African, if his brother was an African, he was an African. There's nothing implying any other ethnicities in Noah's house other than African. There's one ethnicity that we know is there, which is African, the only one, any any clue of any other one, right? Japheth's name means fair. That just means light, bright skinned. That doesn't mean, you know, a lot of black people, I use this when people try to uh, make the assumption that uh, Esau was white because the Bible says he was red when he was born. And so I'll make this point that black people, so-called African-Americans, if you're watching this, if you're watching this, <clears throat> just about every so-called African-American watching this knows somebody with the nickname Red because they're so bright, right? So we call each other Red. This is my point on that. So we call each other Red. So, that, so a person doesn't have to be white as an ethnicity to be Red, you know? It's, you know, it's... So it, it, there's nothing implying that Esau was white. And I always say when Rebecca, uh, <clears throat> when Isaac, Jacob and Esau's father, was, uh, was uh, when he called Jacob to him, when Jacob was uh, posing as Esau, Isaac was, he couldn't see, he was blind. Jacob was able to trick his father but I always say if Isaac, if, if Esau was a white man, as in European, what we call European, all Isaac would have had to do was feel Jacob's hair. That would have been all he had to do. He was intelligent. He was an intelligent old man. If he really wanted to find out, as a matter of fact, I don't even believe Rebecca would have done that. I don't, even believe, I don't believe that Rebecca, a loving mother, would have put her son in that position to get busted like that when it would have been so easy. Who poses as a white person? Who, you know, who would have, I don't believe she would have did that. It's just, so anyway, so I'm just saying, uh, Japheth's name means fair, but that doesn't, that doesn't give an ethnicity. So, uh, you know, Noah's house was, a, was an African house. That's pretty clear. So, so it was an African family. So I'm just saying the Canaanites were an African people. Now, some people say that they had uh, leprosy because of the curse. 
that Noah put on Canaan. But the curse don't say nothing about anybody's skin color. Just read the Bible. Genesis 9 chapter when, when uh, uh, Canaan was cursed. It doesn't say anything. 9 to 10, yeah, 9 chapter. It doesn't say anything about nobody's skin color changing. All it says is that Canaan will be a servant of servants. He just said he'll be a servant. He'll be enslaved. That's it. Canaan will be enslaved. It doesn't say nothing about nobody's skin color changing. Read it. Nothing about nobody's skin color changing. So I'm not saying what God can't do. I'm talking about what's not written. We get our information from what's written. You can say what God can do, what God can't do. I don't, I don't disagree. I know God can do anything. He can make me purple or green or whatever, but it's not written that he did none of that. So you can't just, oh, well, what, you know, God can, you know, make a tree walk. Well, he can, but it's not written that he made any trees walk, right? You can't do that. It's, you know, it's not sound. That leaves too much room for, you know, for manipulation so we have to go about what's written and it's written nowhere that nobody in Noah's house was any other ethnicity other than African well, that would that would mean that Abraham was a descendant of Shem who was an African so Abraham was an African so he hang around African so Melchizedek when he met him he was an African he was a Canaanite so anyway, I was just making the point that God wrote specific, and I'm, I'm gonna get off there because I can. <clears throat> but the 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 uh, Canaanites were Africans, all right. But I was making a point that in the book of Hebrews, God wrote it specifically to Hebrew people. That was a conversation that they needed, and then He wrote the book of also the, the next book after Hebrews is the book of James, and James one and one, it says specifically that it was written to the 12 tribes Hebrews the book of James was written to the Hebrew people and in the next book first Peter 1 and 1 it actually says that it was written to strangers who are living in Gentile countries read it just read it to strangers living in and the name of all these different uh, Galatia and these different Gentile countries and that's they're talking about the, the God in different and different versions actually says God's elect or God's people living in those countries. That book was written to the Hebrews also. So there's three books right there that it's written in stone that those were written to specific Hebrew people. And like we say, it's not because salvation is different for certain people. The conversation is different because of people's needs. This is part of being whole. God don't lump everybody together. He don't make no cookie cutter or you got to receive the same message that your brother received. No, because you might have a different need, a different understanding. You might need to, need to hear something a little different, not that it's different as in, as in the message, but, but worded a little differently according to your needs. And God don't compare you with nobody else. And even as a people, God don't compare one people he don't. He doesn't make one people have to uh, be like another people. You are unique in who you are, even though that this culture is standardized off of. You know, it's a European culture, European culture, Eurocentric culture. So all of us learned Eurocentric history. So we need. So we we know about Shakespeare. We know about. You know, every all these Chris, Christopher Columbus, Christopher Colum, what they call Christopher Columbus. Um, you know, he didn't discover America. It was Africans here. It's a it's a lot that we can talk about. But but this is a Eurocentric culture. So I, I can't really just say that they're wrong in that aspect because they're teaching their people. This is their conversation. This is their country. They got this country with blood. They're not gonna give it up for free. That's just, we have to be, we have to take a little more responsibility and God requires that. Not to expect another people to just give us everything and tell us everything that we need to know about ourselves. Even though they might have twisted it up and put us in the situation that we're in, I'm not gonna sit back and wait on somebody else 
to save me, to deliver me when I'm a grown man who's supposed to be free. Uh, Frederick Douglass said, they didn't free us. They didn't free us. They just took the collars off of us and let us roam, let us go. They couldn't free us. All they could do is take the chains off. Let you go with that when I could go on and on, but we have a responsibility. All right, God bless everybody. Grace and peace.